Welcome back to Dum Dums and Dragons, where improvisers who've never roleplayed before journey into the world of Dungeons and Dragons. I am the Grand Wizard Bukaki, your host. Frankenquinny's body is unraveling, so it's up to Butthole and Alan to travel into the jungle to save him. But will our heroes be able to find the mysterious Well of Souls? Can they really destroy this necromantic construct? Will Quinny be able to survive being shackled to Ranger on the airship? Find out next on Dum Dums and Dragons. You've been safely smuggled into Port Nyanzaru, which is the main port city of Colt. Butthole, Goblin Jr., and Alan, you step off into a tropical city under a blazing sun. You hear the sound of the harbor. You can hear creaking ropes and sort of slapping waves, people rolling barrels around. You get the aroma of spices and tropical fruit, as well as an explosion of color. All of the, uh, the buildings are painted in bright colors. You see bright greens, blues, oranges, salmon pink, with huge murals of giant reptiles and mythological heroes. There's baskets of fresh flowers everywhere. You can see there are minstrels performing songs in bright colors. There's pennants and sun awnings everywhere. You get the sense, uh, even just you can feel it, it's so hot here, that shade is a, generally a, a good thing. And uh, the whole city seems to be bustling, sweating, laughing, swearing, and singing. So you've arrived, you've been told that there's only one person who can guide you to the Well of Souls, and thus you set out in search of Mr. Mittens, who you've been told is known to uh, frequent a certain tavern in town that is known to uh, also supply cat Nip. Alan, we should probably get going. This is one hell of a cult, eh? Y- yeah, I don't, I don't... Like, just take is, it take it all in. What a cult. <laughs> just everybody here, eh? All in the same one. I don't think it's cult. Yeah, it's, I, it's think this, it's, I think it's cult. That's what they told us. This is a cult. We're going to a... I didn't say it earlier, no, but we're clearly I'm going to a cult. I'm going to cut you off right there. It's cult. We're not doing this. I thought we were... This fu- is a serious... We're on a time limit. The cult of the dragon is here. The look on Laura's face is... <laughs> is this is where the audio medium really fails. We got up really early today, okay? <laughs> Yeah, we had to get smuggled into this cult. All right, let's go get Mr. Mittens. And so the two of you set off. It's a busy port town. You can hear all sorts of languages you're not familiar with. Alan, I think for you particularly, even though you're in a bit of a grimmer place, your mind is still always hungry, and this is a pretty cool place. You can hear the voice in the back of your head sigh at one point and say, I remember places like this. They were beautiful. As you make your way through the crowds, Goblin Jr. is just just smelling so many things. I'm pretty used to this voice. Yes. At this point. 100%. So it does not phase me at all. Just want to be clear. You can also converse with it if you want. I'm just going to say, uh uh-huh, and we're going. Great. Um, (laughs) And butthole for you, I think, potential friends everywhere in this place. Everyone seems to be having a good time. But, of course, you are worried about your old pal Quinny. But you're sure Ranger is taking very good care of him. Oh, I've never been more sure of anything in my life. Also, subtly, I've gotten myself a very large pre-engagement ring. And I'm trying to show it off to people who are, like, looking my way. And I think it's subtle, but it's very clearly me holding it near my face. And You know when you get, like, a mirror, you can shine light from the sun in people's eyes? I'm doing that with the ring <laughs> uh, to just passersby. Can you roll me a perception check, please, Ryan? 16 total. As you're doing that, you feel a gentle tug on your hand, and you see a small orphan grabbing the ring and looking up at you, wide-eyed, and then, uh uh-oh, I've been caught. Good try, buddy. And I ruffle his hair, and then I knock him over. (laughs) (laughs) Can you roll me a d4? Three. Can you add your strike? Seven. (laughs) The orphan takes seven points of falling damage. (laughs) He's unconscious. Really? (laughs) I mean, but you continue to walk. You just, you pushed him over. You didn't see what happened. That's. And I stop to cast cure wounds on this poor semi-innocent child. (laughs) Burn those spell slots. All right, great. I don't care. It's so worth the it. uh, the small orphan child wakes up, looks up at you gratefully, and hugs you. Great, Alan. Like, now you bought a scared child. I take his arms and like pry it off me because I'm pretty sure he's going to try to steal something. <laughs> Can you roll me a perception check? <laughs> Seventeen. Yeah, he definitely has your purse. I look at her and say, "Push him over." <laughs> <laughs> and I do. <laughs> Can you roll me a d4, please? Three. Did you add your strength? Three. He takes three points of damage. And just starts weeping and runs away. Great job, Alan. At least he didn't cry when I did it. He couldn't cry. Uh, We're going. We're going. We're going. (laughs) And then I just say, this is one hell of a cult. (laughs) 
just walk off. I right. miss Quinny so much. <laughs> Speaking of Quinny, smash cut to the McSquiggly, where Quinny and Ranger are sitting. If you think about it in like modern terms, it would be the airplane hangar mm-hmm. on like a cargo plane for any action movie where it's like, mm-hmm. we're going on a mission. Right. So it's like that. Some of the mages who uh, work aboard the McSquiggly have built a teleportation circle. When you get the signal, Quinny, it'll be your chance to go through. Until right. then, you're just sitting around. So what are you guys doing? I'm actually, like, there's a little kitchen area mm-hmm. in this mm-hmm. hangar, and I'm trying to make an omelet, but I'm shackled next to this so-and-so. Are you chopping any vegetables? Yes, with my free right hand. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, smelly one, can you pass me the paprika? Here. And oh. I pass you paprika. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't need to have all that attitude stank on your thing. I pull oh. your hand with the shackles under the knife. <laughs> Guy, can you roll me a dexterity safe, please? 20 natural, baby. Uh, <laughs> you pull as hard as you can to get his hand under the knife. Your shoulder pops. Oh, my God. It, so now it's just kind of floppy. I look down at my shoulder and I look up at Alan and I say, shut up. You said you looked up at, at Alan? Oh, yeah, I did say that. Sorry. No, I'll you, you are very short. You're looking at my dick. You just admitted it. You're looking at my dick. Well, so that was just going to be like a little outtake, but now it's in the podcast. I look at his penises. You're looking. (laughs) And I say, shut up, both of you. Don't you dare talk to my dick like that, you dick. Get your dick out of my face. Get your face out of my dick. Unshackle me. (laughs) Never! (laughs) Smash cut back to our heroes. You guys arrive at the tavern you'd been told that you could find Mr. Mittens at. It seems to be less a tavern and more a pet shop. You can hear some meowling come from inside, and then all of a sudden there's a flurry of motion, and a five foot two tabby cat looking dude gets kicked out the front door. And you hear, like, don't come back till you've got more money from inside the pet shop. And you meet Mr. Mittens. Meow. And I go to ruffle his head because I don't know what this is. I just, I'm assuming this is just a cat. Yeah, he, he's, he's like a human sized, human sized cat. Still well, that's cool. I'm still yeah, going to ruffle the top of his head. Mr. Mitten seems into that. So, uh, Jonah, why don't you tell us what Mr. Mitten's looks like? Basically, I'm a ginger and white tabby cat. I'm wearing scale mail wrapped in yarn. Excellent. And uh, what uh, what weapon do you have hanging off your uh, belt there? It is called the Puppy Pounder. Basically, it's a heavy flail. The ball part is completely wrapped in yarn. Yeah. The chain is wrapped in yarn. And the handle is wrapped in yarn. So basically it looks like I have a giant yarn ball that's spiky. I'm taking in the gear and because I'm not that smart, in my head I'm like, I think that's just yarn. Goblin Jr. starts growling and I like put a hand on and hold him back like you do when your dog gets aggressive on a walk. His goblin leg is (laughs) skittering weirdly. Yeah, and I'm like, listen, if you're going to be specist, that's going to be a you thing. I'm not snarf. You're not wrong, but (laughs) I'm not supposed to say that. (laughs) Snarf. He said snowflake. <laughs> then he... You're like roommates. Oh, come on, Goblin Jr. This cat person gets it. Yeah. <laughs> you're pretty observant, Mr. Mittens. Thank you, meow. I assume you're Mr. Mittens because it says so on your name tag. <laughs> He's got a collar on with a little tag that says Mr. Mittens. Oh, I'll see? You. You. And I'm like, that collar is darling, sir. I assume you buy Mr. Mittens some catnip. You, you know, you've got your tankard of ale. Alan's got a tea or something. I haven't done a lot of drinking in a while. If she gets nervous, she can drink it in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> the, the three of you kind of find a shady spot to hang out. And what you learn from Mr. Mittens is that his people are in great trouble. Yeah. It would seem that once a fearsome and noble people, they're increasingly finding themselves turned into house cats oh, and pets. Because of that traitor Grumpy Cat. I hate him. It would seem that one of the Bixie by the name of Grumpy Cat has been turning his fellow cats into pets, which is, of course, the greatest fear of all cat-based people. As a result, Mr. Mittens is one of the last of his kind and is on a desperate mission to defeat Grumpy Cat and destroy the Domesticatrix, which is a crystal that turns cat people or dog people, as it may be, yeah. into house pets. Now, Well, having been a slave for nine months in my past, I am very against this and very on board with this mission to help Mr. Mittens. Thank you. And Goblin Jr. like, snarf, snarf. <laughs> it's definitely about it being a cat. Um, <laughs> yes, I also have a follow-up question about yes. this Domesti- domesticatrix. Uh, Catrix. Catrix. I'm going to have trouble with that. It's uh, fine. Oh, I love how understanding you are. I, you know what? I'm throwing all my assumptions out the window about cats. I'm really interested, but you seem young. So I, I'm I, 12. I'm try- it, it, see, that's the thing. I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question. So like your parents, was <laughs> it like a, a cat and a person? No, it was, or it was, was two cat people. Two cat people. Okay, so follow-up question about the Catrix. 
It can turn the cat people and dog people too. And dog people. Yes. First of all, I gotta meet the dog people. Uh, but oh th- yeah, no, they're all domesticated now. I actually <gasps> think your dog might be one. Snarf, snarf. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no. So where I'm going with this question is, yes. could we use it to do the reverse and turn, say, a dog into a dog person? Mm, I'm not sure about that. You? Um, <laughs> Mr. Mittens turns to the air. <laughs> Gets answers like a crazy so, person. Um, yeah. Basically, uh, Mr. Mittens, you were driven out of your home by mm-hmm. Grumpy Cat and his fellow traders. You're not actually sure what the properties of the domesticatrix are because Grumpy Cat seemed to come by it out of nowhere and in the chaos you had to escape. So you're not sure, but it seems like it might be possible. I pray to Garfield that he might let my people live. Well, if it isn't a Monday, you might be inclined to. <laughs> yeah, that is true. True. I um, order us a meal of sacred lasagna. <laughs> yes. Actually, yeah. so, I can't partake. It's against Moonhammer. No, we'll be right else yeah. So, like, you know, if you're a Christian or whatever, like, the body of Jesus is the bread and then the wine is his blood? Yes. It's completely reversed. The body is lasagna. The blood is milk because he's a cat. Checks out a lot. If you're it's lactose beautiful. intolerant, you're going to have a bad time with this religion. Oh, no. <laughs> no cats are lactose intolerant. I'm learning so much about your people. This, Thank you. This all checks out. So what you need us to yeah. do to help you out, we got to what? K- kill Grumpy Cat. Nice. Yep. Okay. He was my brother. Whoa. Oh. Well, I know classic that. family drama. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Listen, we, you and I got a lot in common. Family yeah. drama so lately. the good news is, at least for the party, that the yeah. Well of Souls, as roughly described to you by the psychics that Garvo had employed, is located deep in the jungles of Kult. But the last known location that it was associated with was Catlandia, the uh, ancestral home of the cat people. Uh, Mr. Mins is able to inform you that he certainly knows of a tomb yes. uh, sort of on the edge of Catlandia that is now guarded, in fact, by Grumpy, Grumpy cat. cat, who's currently in the process of excavating the site, possibly in search of the tomb itself. So by helping Mr. Mittens in his quest to defeat Grumpy Cat and seize control of the domesticatrix, you will also be able to gain access to the tomb bearing the Well of Souls, where, of course, you can use the summoning powders that Alan, you, and your team back on the Mook Squiggly procured to teleport our poor Frank and Quinny into the temple and thus hopefully be able to reverse the effects of the curse. Let's do this. I get on all my fours like a normal cat. I cat crawl up to Alan, mm-hmm. and I just do. I'm still scratching, but now that I know this is a cat person, it's a little weirder. <laughs> I mean, I have cat but instincts. That's cool. Like, that's cool. Anytime I see yarn, I'm going to play with it. Apparently, you're just going to so, wrap your stuff question, in it. Question, do you ever get distracted by like your own armor no. or weapons? Okay. Actually, just- yeah, yeah. I'd say... <laughs> say maybe as I start playing with my flail. <laughs> okay. I, I just being... aside to butthole. Something to watch if we get in a fight. I'm just trying to calm down Goblin Jr. <laughs> Every time he sees you pet the cat person, Goblin Jr. is just like not thrilled. Well, that's the thing is though that the curse actually started happening because Grumpy Cat hated the dog people and so he tried to turn them into the domesticated dogs and he also hated our people for coming into an alliance with the dog people. So he put the curse on both us and the dog people. Well, I think it's time for us to liberate a people and stop this cult we're all in. Am I right? What Mr. Bins is able to tell you is that the site of Catlandia is deep in the jungle. And the jungles of Colt are notoriously dangerous. There's a bunch of crazy things that have happened in Colt over the years. Most notably, there was once a great necromancer who controlled an army of the undead and tried to raise Port Port, Port Landia. <laughs> Landia. Yeah. yeah, Port Landia. <laughs> tried to uh, raise uh, Port Nyanzaru. However, when he was defeated, he lost control of his army. So the jungle is just swarming with zombies. Okay. And of course, there are also the mythological reptiles that you hear uh, stalk the jungles. So very dangerous to travel alone. However, you are in luck because frequently there are expeditions that go out into the jungle. And you're guessing, Alan, based on your work archaeologically over the past little while Mm -hmm. with your team, that there must be resupply missions going. So you're not quite sure where those would originate from, but you feel like if you ask around, you might get some answers. I could do it. I'm a cat. I'm quite charming. Meow, meow. I think you probably know the people around here better than I do. So if you want to show us around, maybe we can... uh... I I take a knee for the first time in a long time, and I pray... Oh, we're trusting this fucking cat person. <laughs> Moonhammer has spoken. Smash cut to hell and Moonhammer just shakes her head. <laughs> oh, back to this. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even ask. <laughs> He's just guessing. Yeah, it's so just guessing. office style cutaways to what Moonhammer's doing in hell. All right, so Jonah, can you roll me a charisma check, please? Huh. And I'll give you advantage. Since you're a cat person, you hang out here a lot. I'm guessing you probably know a lot of people. I got an eight. You start to ask around and... Uh, People hate be- me. Well, 
you notice that almost everyone seems to have a house cat with them and it's really bugging you. Like you realize that these are probably a lot of your old friends. I see Billy over there. He was my best friend. And, and Billy, Billy, no! And Billy's doing that stupid thing cats do where he's like licking up his leg and then he looks at you and then he just goes back to licking <laughs> aggressively. As a result, you're having trouble gathering the information you normally would. Alan, you're kind of watching this and mm-hmm. I think you're observing wow. like he's a cat person. He kind of knows the lay of the land. But you can kind of see he's not getting great results because every time he sees a cat, you can hear in the arms of the angels play and it looks like Sarah McLaughlin would be like, every day a cat person gets turned into a cat. You're realizing like, you know what? This might not be the best course of action. So what are you doing? We want to talk to people who are pro-domestication. So I'm just thinking now... Go along with this. Okay. Could you pretend to be a domesticated cat? Oh my God, that's perfect. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I'm just be a dire cat. That's it. I get an all fours. Goblin Jr. just looks at you and is like, snarf, snarf, snarf. He's really having a hard time with all of this. Plus his goblin leg being a resurrected leg is constantly spasming. And I lean down to Goblin Jr. and I go, I bet you could show him how to do it. You should pretend to be a cat. (laughs) Snarf. Nailing it. So I'm an expert knitter. Basically, I have a yarn backpack of holding. (laughs) Every single thing in there is made out of yarn. I go into my backpack and I just get up some white yarn. It's just the yarn backpack. I forgot to mention. You know what? I will allow it. On that note, because we're doing an expedition mission today, Mm -hmm. I'm going to give each of you five points of stress. Oh, nice. But the yarn backpack is a freebie. I got it from Queen Catnip, my mother. (laughs) It's okay. This is great. So you're the prince. And Grumpy Cat, your brother, is the other prince, yes. now king. This is getting... I went Shakespeare in real I fast I was here. just trying to figure out what the D&D version of Shakespeare was. Yeah. <laughs> no. He's still Shakespeare. He's real old. So you got your yarn out. Meow. What are you making for getting us this supply convoy? I get orange and white yarn, and I just start yarning on his body. Basically, he looks like a tabby and cat. Goblin Jr. is now a yarn Very version of a cat. tabby cat. So I'm just walking Goblin Jr. around, and I'm like, hey, cat owner here, looking for other cat owners to make a supply convoy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to just walk up to strangers who have cats. You attract a lot of people who want you to join their book club. You know, when it comes to book clubs, I'm just considering my options because, you know, there are a lot of book clubs <laughs> in the city and I want to be sure I'm, I'm with the best one. And it sounds like there's the best. But then I'm trying to, like, segue into finding out about a supply convoy. Can you roll me a persuasion check? Nat 20. You're talking to this wizened dragonborn, you know, and he's very excited with the book that his book club's going to read. He's so happy you're into cats as well because he has the best cat. What's his name? Carvin. Oh, I, I, I'm, we're just we're so excited. Uh, we're reading My Life in the Ring by <laughs> The Forsaken. We're very excited. Have you met The Forsaken? Have you heard about him? He is a delight. I've heard about him. And let me tell you, you just wait for the sequel. There's a sequel? It's called The Butthole Inside Me. Okay. Escaping the Forsaken Paradox. <laughs> Wait a minute, but your <laughs> name is Butthole. You're right. Are you? <laughs> Smash cat to Ann and on McSquiggly, and suddenly a chill goes over her. There's a wasted opportunity to make money. No! <laughs> Smash cat back. Um, the book club is doing The Forsaken. He's super excited. He promises to keep your identity safe, but um, you get the sense that because you are The Forsaken and you rolled a 20, you might be able to get a lot of information from these people because they're all going to like hero worship you in the way that like a writer with a pseudonym would get worshipped at a book club. Yeah, and it's especially great and convenient for me, but I'm trying to avoid actually talking about the book because it was definitely written by Annan. <laughs> <laughs> Have so, you read it at all? Oh, I, I proved the cover. <laughs> and then I looked in and I actually requested in my time as the Forsaken that every page should just be the word pain in a bold, large font for about 100 pages. And then I said for the last 35 pages... We're going to alternate between a picture of a dick and then space where it says, write down what hurts you, and then it would be done. <laughs> like it's a full book. It yeah. tells his backstory. She said like, she'd do that, but put a little flair on it and then hired George R.R. R. Dwarfin, and he did a, a bit of a punch up. <laughs> well, he did a punch up on the first third, but it was taking too long. So then she just ghost wrote the rest herself on an evening field. He's like, I'm still working on it. And she's like, oh, stop releasing those anthologies.
Anyway, so um, <laughs> you uh, you arrive at the book club, and it's in a nice sort of shady veranda overlooking the water. There's uh, lots of cats, just cats everywhere. Goblin Jr. is clearly the largest of them, but all the cats seem to be getting along with him. They're really impressed by his whiskers. They seem like really classy whiskers, like a professional grade. Royal grade. Yeah, so the they, whiskers they, of a prince. Yeah, they open the book and like the first page says, dedicated to the memory of Murder Child. R.I.P. Murder Child. Aww. So they start talking about it. I miss you, blood chair. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, you're only an investigation check. Always great when we rely on my intelligence. <laughs> That would be an eight total. You have minus one. You are correct. So do I. I are you never surprised? Knew that. His intelligence. I just remember. I like to learn things from my gut. I make a lot of assumptions no, that turn it, out to be right. It makes sense. I've never known it was minus one. We should one. just that get hurts. Alan to come and be like, "I'm his friend." Not a bad I'm idea. I'm going to be honest. That's what I usually do. So, <laughs> so Ryan, I'm going to spend a point of stress to be where Butthole is. So basically, you saw Butthole stride gallantly up to this wizened old dragon man with a hat and start talking and you're like, oh man, this is a really good opportunity. Then you heard butthole start to talk and you're like, this is a terrible opportunity. Around the time you said the butthole inside all of us, I think Alan, you decided, you know, I should go with him. <laughs> you being a book lover yourself integrated very seamlessly uh, to the point that no one even knew you were there until you spent stress to appear. <laughs> um, so yes, you're also in the room. What would you like to do? I would just like to put a hand on butthole's shoulder and just say, you know what? Uh, wait, what's, what, what's the guy's name that we're talking to? Carvin. Do we know Carvin? Now that you're at the book club, there's six or seven people talking about the book. How their favorite chapter was the one about his dad. And it was like their dad. It reminded them of, of their family. Yeah. But at the same time, I haven't read this version of the book. And I was pretty sure it just said pain. Oh, yeah. Page 82. And because Annan took a lot of liberties with it, but also was tracking your story, almost every page has some reference <laughs> to your father. So that's actually accurate. Nailed it. <laughs> So I come up to Butthole and insert myself into the conversation. Yes, and we we're actually planning on getting new material for Butthole's next book and go on further adventures. And we're wondering if you know of any expeditions that are going out that we could join up with. This is my friend Alan. Her dad sucks, too. <laughs> yeah, he really does. <laughs> he yep. really, really does. <laughs> This is Goblin Jr. His dad was a goblin. It's and I just whisper now. like pathological helping. <laughs> goblin Jr. is still obviously in cat disguise. Um, <laughs> Luckily, Goblin Jr. is a not species specific name. <laughs> yeah. True. Alan, can you roll me a persuasion check or an investigation check, please? Sure. Of course, she gets persuasion. <laughs> in, I'm going to choose investigation. Thought you might. <laughs> Eight. Yep. I just was with a, my just plus a six. Super team going on here. <laughs> um, I look over into the corner and I'm like, Mr. Mittens. Come tell us about your dad. Well, um, no, no, shh, no. <laughs> Never mind then. Can't. Meow, 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 <laughs> meow. That was a, that meow, was a meow, meow. Good, good trick. <laughs> meow, meow, <laughs> butthole. Meow. So Carvin noticed this because he loves cats. Wait, can your cat speak? Meow. Does that mean that my cat, Mungo Jerry, can speak? And he looks to his cat, and his cat just stares at him, and he looks to his cat, and he kind of nods, and he's like, "Hmm, yeah. I get it." What? Basically, try so it to- says our cat. He's answering, <laughs> thinking it was me. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, can you, uh, Mr. Mittens, how do you want to deal with this? Do you want to try and pretend you're still a house cat, or do you want to reveal your true identity? I just kind of crawl out of the room. You crawl out of the room, just back away slowly. <laughs> like, oh, it's so strange. That large talking cat just left. Hey, it's really hard to teach him to walk backwards. I'm I mean, a cat moonwalking back. That is one cool cat. Michael Katzen. Oh, woof. <laughs> um, so, Alan, despite your <laughs> abysmal role, you're in a friendly room, and they're very excited about the potential of a second Forsaken book. Although they are confused. I mean, the description of the Forsaken is very different from the man they see before them. But, you know, they'll, they'll take your word for it. They assume it's just artistic license. They tell you that the Dark Tooth Syndicate has been uh, responsible for the resupply missions out to the excavation. There's certainly a lot of expeditions out into the jungle, but the members of the Dark Tooth have been hiring a lot of mercenaries in town and buying up supplies. Supplies and various people in the book club run various stores and shops and are like, oh, yes, you know, they, they bought a lot of excavation supplies for me. I sold a lot of shovels and that sort of thing. So they describe the commander of the Dark Tooth, a gentleman by the name of Marvin Bonesworth, who is a pug person. He's like a uh, four foot three squat mercenary in sort of like heavy leather armor. He seems to know what he's doing, and he's one of the few remaining dog people uh, running around. And he's the mercenary commander in charge of the Dark Tooth. One of them who uh, frequents the local pub says that uh, he's definitely seen some guards drinking there previously. 
Marvin seems to be currently buying up a lot of basic supplies. It seems like this next resupply is going to be largely food-based and a lot of sort of necessaries along encampment. Hmm. I just want to take butthole aside. I'm like, this is a dog person. I think he's probably going to the same place we are. Most likely, yes. I'm secretly behind you. <laughs> yeah. Cats are sneaky. I am sneaky. Uh, I have we, a- we look up and Mr. Mittens is just on top of a bookshelf <laughs> <laughs> looking down at us. Our goals may be aligned. Okay, so we got to go work for this dark tooth guy. Okay, Mr. Mittens, you, you know the locals. What's the rarest thing that everybody wants when it comes to food? Dog food. Dog food is super rare. That makes sense. Dog people are super rare. Here's what I'm thinking. Step one, you get the dog food. Wait, dog person, dog food. That's what I meant. You get the dog person, dog food. Step two. You get the power. <laughs> <laughs> Step three, you get a right to the encampment. Hey. <laughs> Hoo-ah. <laughs> <laughs> who, who are you? <laughs> I saw the traveling stage show Dogface. <laughs> it was about a dog person who took power in a criminal empire and ultimately it foiled him. So I'm saying let's do the first two. <laughs> But let's not get the women, because I think that's where he made the wrong turn. You remember Merle Streep and all the hijinks, and you realize, yes, this this could be a problem. <laughs> Smash cut to Merle Streep somewhere, remembering that dance. <laughs> <Yeah>. Confused. <laughs> <laughs> they were able to give you some directions to the marketplace. It's not far from here, and you think you could probably procure the supplies there. Thanks for the book club. Totally going to join. I'm going to bring you the membership fee tomorrow. Just got to take my cat and my other cat out into the distance. Here, watch me throw my voice. It'll look like Mr. Mittens is talking. And I open my mouth and just go, uh, Hi! Nailed it. Okay, <laughs> bye. And then we, we leave. <laughs> After you leave, they're like, Well, he's much nicer than the book suggested. He definitely wouldn't beat a man to death in an arena. That's crazy. <laughs> that oh, man well. would never knock a child unconscious. <laughs> Smash cut to um, <laughs> Fagin's lair. Out. <laughs> Fagin's the kid, lair. Yeah, and the kid's like, I'm sorry, sir. I tried. I tried to steal a ring. I tried to steal a purse. And what happened? I got knocked unconscious again. You are truly the worst orphan I know. <laughs> he, just, he just turns around and says, love. And then he gets pushed over. <laughs> All right. Oh, God. Kept back to the marketplace. It's like a bazaar. Like, there's just, uh, you know, people selling wares everywhere. Very busy, very crowded. And you're looking for dog person dog food. Now, this is an extraordinarily rare food Mm -hmm. because the dog people generally have disappeared, possibly due to grumpy cat's interference. So how are you going to try and find the food? I say we let Goblin Jr. be our guide on this one. Yes. Dog cat person. Go. (laughs) (laughs) And I kneel down. And I rest a hand on Goblin Jr.'s yarny face. And I just say, you will succeed by the will of the goddess. And I burp and a glowing hammer pops out and it floats in the air in front of him. And then it goes into his head and just rests. And then there's a little bit of a glow that just absorbs in. And I cast guidance on him (laughs) to increase his odds of success. Well, you know how Goblin Jr. roll. He nods to you, nods to Alan, kind of like looks at Mr. Mittens, but like starting to like Mr. Mittens, you know, like he, he's actually pretty happy with this cat outfit he's wearing. Game respect game. Uh, <laughs> and then um, he bolts off into the crowd. You kind of, you know, spend a couple minutes just hanging out. I'm just knitting right now. What are you knitting? Scarf. <laughs> scarf, scarf, am I right? Um, <laughs> so uh, Goblin Jr. comes back moments later and he starts tugging on Alan's sleeve. Hey, buddy, what you got? Uh-huh. He's leading you uh, right. in, in like right. a classic okay. lassie okay. way. So first he takes you to a well and he points down the well and there's a kid down there named Timmy. Do you save Timmy? It's the orphan Fagin pushed oh in. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I run and jump in. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So Mr. Mittens, you begin to fall down the well. It's actually further than you thought. Can you please roll me an athletics check? Oh. Net 20. You throw your knitting needle claws out. This is not your first time jumping down a well. <laughs> and so you just kind of like claw your way down. You slow oh, your descent. And awesome. at the bottom of the well, there's an orphan who's singing <laughs> Where is Love? Um, <laughs> and he's like, um, hello, giant cat person. Would you be able to help me out of the well? Meow. He assumes that's a yes or he hopes so. So he, he raises his little tiny orphany arms up. I use my feet to hold him. Nice. And um, just strong arm it, yeah, like just, climb it uh, up. So you, you claw your way up and out of the well. And you get out despite the heat. You notice he's shivering. Is there something perhaps you could give him that you've been knitting? I give him the tabby cat scarf. He, he puts the scarf on. It's like when Michael Caine puts his scarf on at the end of Christmas Carol. For me? Thank you, cat person. That's and then awesome. he starts to walk away. Wait. And I summon him back and I say, get us the biggest chicken for this Christmas. And I give him five gold pieces. The one as big as me? Yep. Wait, is he big? (laughs) No, he's pretty small. (laughs) Bigger. (laughs) 
He takes the money and he runs off. And I lean over to Alan and I go, he's going to steal that money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. He's going back down that well. <laughs> Oh, my God. So, Mr. Mittens, I'm going to give you one point of inspiration for saving the orphan down the well. And Goblin Jr. looks at you and he's like, snare, snare. Because, you know, he's always wanted to save an orphan down a well. And this was his first opportunity to do so. So he's real jazzed about this. I'm going to give Goblin Jr. a point of inspiration, too. Uh, great. So after that, he then leads you to, I think, like the shop from Gremlins. Just like a crazy, oh. weird curiosity shop. And it seems to be run by, for lack of a better term, a fairly generic human. Uh, and he's like, hi, I'm Gary. Welcome to my shop. You sure your name's Gary? Do you roll me a <laughs> perception check? Okay. I got a 22. It's not Gary. It's Gerinald. <laughs> Gerinald. And then I look at him and I go, you're not that nondescript after all. <laughs> and he sighs and all of a sudden, like, the glamour falls away. And, like, yeah, it ball. turns out he's actually a two-headed ogre. Oh, I told you this wouldn't work. And the other head's like, well, Gerald, we had to try. Anyway, welcome to our shop. We sell glamours, but you won't want them. <laughs> Okay, wait, I got a question. Is one of your heads named Gary and is the other named Nult? They nod and you wish it was in unison because that would look better, but it's like gently out. <laughs> out it's, it's just enough to be unsettling. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Garinald. So we're looking for dog person food. Dog person food? Oh, there's no dog person food around here. Clearly you the worst sure liar in the that? world. They both look at you and clearly you've got their number and they're like, go oh, fine, just don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, and Goblin Jr.'s like, snarf, snarf, and he gives Mr. Mittens props. Garinald goes in the back and drags out a sack that has Purina sewn into it. He brings it out and he says, now this is the last known one okay, in, in the port city. Uh, well, it's not cheap. We've got, a, we've got a shop to run after all. Okay, you want a scarf? Gary looks at an old, Gary's nodding and an old is shaking his head. Uh, so mittens? do you want to try and persuade? Do you want to threaten? Do you no, want to no, intimidate? I'm going to try and um, persuade him. Go ahead and roll a persuasion check, please. I got a 15. 15? Enold's neck is never cold, but Gary's neck is always cold, and Gary complains about it enough that Enold's like, okay, well, yeah, sure, I'll take a scarf, but that's not going to be enough. <laughs> and then they look at Goblin Jr., and we wanted a pet for a while. Uh, could we have your giant cat? I can make you a yarn cat. Oh, no, we, we want one that walks around and says things yeah. like snarf. Here's the question. I can make a yarn pet that... Does I, that. I'd like to just pause for a second and <laughs> converse with my friend. Yes. You can make a yarn cat that can walk? I just want to see that. So I'd okay. say, here, do you know what, sir? I jump in my backpack. Let's have this conversation in a minute if this is false. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay uh, so explain to me how you can animate this yarn cat. Basically, every single person in Catlandia can do anything cat related. So our cat mages, they are able to animate yarn. And I have some yarn that's already animated that it can form into a pet cat. That's going to cost you three stress, but I like the fact that it's the yarn that's enchanted, not that you magically have the power. So I'll that's, give it to you. That's the uh, best yeah, stress-based pitch I've ever that's heard. Great. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> I think Quiddy wanted a knife one time. <laughs> Can you roll me a dexterity check, please, oh, to good. create the yarn cat? Uh, I got an eight. Oh, you got rolled a six. Oh, my God. Start knitting together this cat. Unfortunately, your claws still hurt from going down that well. And ultimately, it looks pretty fugly. But the good news is that Garinold is looking at this thing, and they're like, enchanted yarn? Yeah. That's amazing. Screw the cat. We'll just take the enchanted yarn. And then it meows. But because it's all weird, it's like, <laughs> And they're like, okay. And they quickly pull apart the mouth. They're like, we don't, we don't want that. And I'm <laughs> like, you think that meowing's weird? Check this out. I point at Goblin Jr. <laughs> no. <laughs> then I talk to Garinold. Hey, can you give me a second? I just need to, to do a few adjustments for that guy. And then I'm just going to roll again. They may just want the yarn, but they're getting that friggin' cat. I got five! Cat. <laughs> Unfortunately, in trying to recreate the cat, you destroyed the enchantment on the magic yarn. Damn. So now you're just back to Scarf, and they're like, well, now we need that cat. That cat's got to live with us. See, this is why I said we might come back to this conversation. So here's the real question, though. How well do you treat your animals? Can I just ask a... <laughs> A seemingly obvious question. Would you like gold? Yeah, gold would be great. Why didn't you offer that earlier? <laughs> well, how much gold? Okay, then we'll go for uh, 500. I got 20. I've got 50. <laughs> 
How much do you have? I got my forsaken how F much you are, money. How uh, much are you? Well, I'm not giving you a total, Mr. Mittens. Let's stay friends. Let's hit 500. Yep. Here's the challenge. You would said don't tell anybody that you have dog purse and dog food, and you clearly do. And then I do a prayer because I'm deciding whether or not I'm going to try to extort them. Oh, my God. I was thinking <laughs> oh, the same thing. Oh, they're nice. What if we do 450 and we give you a scarf sewn by a prince? We are fans of the fabled bard prince. So, yeah, we'll, we'll take that deal. Fabulous. So I, I give them 450 gold and... I will up a scarf in 10 minutes. They're very happy with that. They try and wind it around both their necks, but doesn't really work. Also, like, there's a weird market for scarves in this incredibly hot jungle. Really? <laughs> I don't know. People just like them. So they give you the bag of dark person dog food. Good. They look longingly at Goblin Jr., who kind of shuffles out of his cat hood and winks at them as a wolf. And they're like, a wolf? What? And then Goblin Jr. walks out. I'm taking his disguise. Um, but I just put it in my backpack in case I can sell it later. The rest of you leaving as well? I'm just going to take the dog person dog food. Yeah, can we get a bag for this? <laughs> Five a cents. A doggy bag? <laughs> oh. bum, bum, bum. They look around and come back out with with a bag that says thanks for shopping at Shag Nasty's gift shop and gives oh it to you. Oh my god. Well, going to my sister. I put the dog food inside the bag and I look at the two of them before I go and I say, honestly, the glamour was pretty good. If it weren't for the cat, we would never have known. Well, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to us. Thank you, sir. No problem. Praise Moonhammer. Am I right? And they both nod. And Garfield. Oh, Garfield. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, praise Garfield. We get that. I hate Mondays. Mondays <laughs> suck. I grumble because I walk away. Freaking cat person stealing <laughs> okay, Moonhammer's hey, thunder. Come on, come on. And Garfield's friend with Moonhammer. Okay. See, the things I don't know. This is the thing. You always think you know, and then you don't, or you're blatantly wrong. Because you're stupid, and that's a lot of my life. <laughs> Smash cut to Moonhammer doing a gym take, like a talking head's office bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, Garfield, yeah, I met him once, he's fine. But don't you talk to me about that son of a bitch Marmaduke. <laughs> cut back. You make your way back into the marketplace, sort of on the edge of town. You can see where a lot of the mounts are set up to take supplies out into the jungle. It's pretty easy to find Marvin Bonesworth because he's the only one who looks like a pug. So you see him, he's yelling orders. Meow. He's doing that, like, horrible pug breathing. <laughs> <laughs> He's just trying his best um, <laughs> to, to survive. He's currently ordering some of his guards to hitch a wagon up to a, a small four-legged dinosaur who's kind of like a smaller triceratops. Oh, I've never seen this before. I am going to the dinosaur. Thank you. Well, so am I. Jeez. <laughs> so uh, the dinosaur just... Am I the only one who's actually interested in the dog pug person? Yes, At you are, moment, Mr. Mittens. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Mittens, having, uh, having lived amongst dinosaurs for a while, they're not as exciting to you no. as, as they used to be, but certainly to two travelers. They, I mean, I had know. a pet raptor, so I'm fine. Yeah, the dinosaur just looks like domesticated, tiny triceratops. You know, it's got the full crest and the three horns. Mm -hmm. It's got a harness and just seems to be waiting politely as it's getting uh, loaded up. This is so cute. <laughs> I pat it on the head. I'm just like... Mm. And then I take out some rations and try to feed it some rations. <laughs> and it kind of looks at them and starts doing that weird dry tongue poke thing that Ew. I assume from Jurassic Park happens in real life. <laughs> Marvin comes over and he's like, oh, uh, I, oh sorry, uh, they, uh, they, they only eat uh, veggies there. Uh, yeah. Hey, so are you Mr. Marvin? And I pull out some celery and <laughs> feed it to the tracer. Oh, you see, you see, she, she gets it. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh -huh. that's, that's very nice. Oh, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Marvin da uh, Bonesworth. Uh, what can I do you for? So, Marvin, I understand you're going off into the jungle. Oh, uh, yep. I sneak up on him. Uh, I hope there's no cat people sneaking up on me. Meow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Oh, Marmaduke, that scared me. Okay, um, we are uh, we are uh, a cat person. Hey, we don't see many of you around here Remember anymore. Remember me, Mr. Bonesworth? Oh, it's you, Mittens. I lean over to Alan and I go, these guys have a real yeah. will they, won't they vibe. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly his demeanor changes, he becomes much more professional. What do you want, Mittens? I'm trying to fix my people. <laughs> what were you saying? <laughs> Why would I want more of your cat folk around? Do you remember the alliance we signed like 10 years ago? That one of your people broke? Yes, I do. He hated every single cat person and every single dog person. What do you expect? No, oh, I suppose that's true. <laughs> he was very grumpy, hence his name Grumpy Cat. Yes. I've got a bone to pick with him, and as Did you know, we Bonesworths pick bones well. So, what, you're proposing yet another alliance? I guess so. Oh, that's a pretty convincing pitch. <laughs> Boy, what do you two want? They're here helping me on a mission, too. He seems kind of hesitant to work with you again, Mittens. You get the sense the cost of the puppy war was too high and that the broken alliance and the treachery of Grumpy Cat has really put him in a place of distrust. What do you guys do? I say, listen, clearly you've got some past history with our friend, Mr. Mittens. Yeah. I'm Butthole Farch, Cleric of Moonhammer. Probably heard about her. Best goddess ever. Mm -hmm. uh, ruling over hell right now. So honestly, you're going there. You could do to have a friend. And then we've got Alan. 
Hello. Uh, I, I'm just going to go with the term Sorcerer Supreme. It's not appropriate. She's a wizard, not a sorcerer, but I still said it. I've got a history with the Greywater Syndicate. We'd like to uh, join you on this little trek along with Mittens. We understand question marks over here. We got you a little uh, signing bonus. And I, I open the bag up and I show him the dog person dog food. Oh, I haven't seen some of that in a long time. Yeah, cost me some knitting. Oh, I know that's a that's a mighty high cost for you, Mittens. Yeah, I'm sure it was an exhausting 10 minutes. <laughs> You see him look down and you can see just the faintest edge of a hand knit sock poking up from his boot that he quickly stuffs back in. That's the scarf I gave you for your 10th birthday. Yes. And as it fell apart, I continued to turn it into other garments (laughs) and all that was left was enough for a sock. Knowing where we're at here, we could throw you a little uh, dog person dog food. We could throw you perhaps a second sock. (laughs) Some options. Sounds like someone's been reading my dream journal. A second sock could be delightful. <laughs> I suppose uh, I suppose you could join the caravan if you want. Right? Yeah, that's cool with me. Let's do this. Yay! I give him the, the dog person dog food in the bag. And I need a sock for him in like five minutes. He secrets the dog food away uh, on one of the carts. So basically, the expedition will be leaving in the morning, which gives you some more time to explore the city. He notices, Alan, your interest in the Triceratops, and mm-hmm. he says that dinosaurs are used for a lot of things, transportation, entertainment, all sorts of things uh, in cult. They're very common. We're likely to see more along the path, but he warns you to not be as friendly with those ones because not all of them are as kind as Sarah, his Triceratops. Are there dinosaur people? There's all sorts of people in the world. I am but a humble pug. All right. I don't think so. (laughs) I mean, I guess there's Dragonborn, but it's not really the same. No. So you have the remainder of the day to search the town for anything you might need. You can bed in for the night. You can do whatever you want. I'm going to chill out and read through my book a little bit more and just prepare some spells. I go to find Alan. I'm assuming we're doing like an inn or whatever. I just assumed I was in my hut. That's fine. So you've cast a magical hut. Uh, I also would like to have spent the afternoon searching to see if there are dinosaurs we can purchase for riding, specifically Velociraptor style dinosaurs instead of ponies. Yes. How much are said dinosaurs? <laughs> for the expedition, you can each get one for 50 gold. I pay 75 each, and I want the fanciest fucking dinosaurs, and I want one for Goblin Jr. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you get three raptors who have very nice plumage, fancy saddles and everything else. The one you get, Butthole, seems to have like some pep in its step. It's the cocky raptor. If this was Jurassic World, it would be the blue. It's blue, yeah. That's where we were going with that. <laughs> Brian, you've got blue. Alan, the one you've got, you know, in the original Jurassic Park, there's those ones who always look like they're grinning and ready to murder. Yeah. That's the one you get. Excellent. (laughs) Mr. Mittens. So they're both on plumed ones because dinosaurs in real life. Yours has been shaved and he's got wicked cool tattoos of flames going down his sides. So you have the Dave Batista. You have the Dave Batista of raptors. Uh, I get my cat costume out that I took from Goblin Jr. And I put it on my raptor. Cool. What do you want to name the raptor? Mr. Raptor. Um, Wait, no, Raptor Senior. Raptor Senior. I realize Goblin Jr. doesn't need a ride. I know what Goblin Jr. is doing that night, which is I leave Goblin Jr. out there with the Raptors so he can establish himself as the Alpha and then train the pack. Except rather than doing it in a way a dog would do it, he does that thing Chris Pratt does oh in Jurassic God. World where he just holds up a paw in front of them. And for some reason, the Raptors are just like, and he's like, snarf. Yeah. Snarf. And they're like, he's really funny and relatable. And I feel like he's like me. And then he goes around and he's got his little satchel on his oh backpack and he pulls out rations and throws them each treats and then he starts actually uh, just yelling at the what's my snack (laughs) (laughs) he also teaches them how to parade on their back legs like you taught him way back in the day because you know he just sometimes Moonhammer's got to be praised in a parade I completely agree with all of this at the end of it he takes out his special bowl and he lets each of them go up and take one lick of water from it and then he bats them away (laughs) he's like (laughs) snarf Um, so good (laughs) yep okay so I go to Alan's hut at the end of the day I knock on the hut. Like, I try knocking. Does it make a sound? What, I don't know the hut rules. Yeah. So then I go, I go in. Come on in. So, Alan, I meant to do this earlier. I keep meaning to do this, and I keep forgetting. But I got you something when I was away for so long, because, you know, I got Quinny, like, the coolest body anyone's ever had. Smash cut to Quinny with Ranger. I'm sitting at a table with Ranger, eating the omelet that he made for me. And I try to hold a fork and it falls out of my hand. So I like lean down to pick it up and I just fall out of my chair. And you pull me with you to yeah. the ground like, oh, <laughs> God damn it. Stop doing that. Shut up. <laughs> so I just cut back to our heroes. <laughs> so, I mean, he's the happiest he's ever mm-hmm. been. And I mean, we all know it. Uh, he, he pretends he's grumpy because that's his thing. But like I, I wanted to get you something. So I know a lot of like famous wizards and stuff have familiars who like go places and do cool stuff for them. Yeah. So I wanted to get you something. And then I take a box out of my back pocket. I'm just filled with trepidation. It's like the length of a forearm. Like it's probably a foot long. It's like lacquered. It looks like a little coffin. It's amazing. 
and then I give it to Alan. Flashback to the last time I opened a box about this size. <laughs> it did not go so well. Mm. Thanks. I mean, you didn't have to do, I mean, I didn't get you anything. You got me your friendship after a fight where you came back and then I was worried you were going to like punch me in the face or be real mean. But instead you were so understanding and wonderful. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the many reasons you deserve this gift. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then I just put my okay. head in. Just open the box. Okay. And I open the What's box. What's in the box? What's in the <laughs> box? Everywhere. I'm just everywhere at and once. When the box opens, I just say to her, his name is Billy Fingers. This episode of Dum Dums and Dragons features the voices of Ryan LaPlante at the Ryan LaPlante on Twitter, Tyler Hewitt at Tyler underscore Hewitt on Twitter, Laura Hamstra at El Hamstring on Twitter, our special guest, and our DM Tom McGee at McGee TD on Twitter. This episode's sound was edited and mixed by Laura Hamstra. And Dum Dums and Dragons artwork is by Del Borovic, who can be found at delborovic.com. Our theme songs are And Now for That Massive Coronary and Skipping Through the Orchestra Pit Part 1 by Peter Gresser. And our ad music is No Control and Chiefs by Jazzar, J-A-H-Z-Z-A-R, all available at freemusicarchive.org. When it comes to Dum Dums and Dice, you can visit our website at dumdumdice.com. Our Twitter and Instagram are at dumdumdice, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash dumdumdice. But most importantly, we've got merchandise at redbubble.com slash people slash dumdumdice, or you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash dumdumdice. That's D-U-M-B, D-U-M-B, D-I-C-E. And tune in next week for more Dum Dums and Dragons. (laughs) 